Am I? Oh, there I am. Good morning <laughs> again. <laughs> Welcome to St. Matthew's on a kind of humid day, but a lot cooler than it's been. And today is special in so many ways. Today we have choir singing with us. Yay. We also celebrate our 56th birthday as a church today. Yay. And we also remember, we remember 9-11, and we remember the families affected, we remember our country affected, and we'll be praying and learning more about that later on in this service. So as we give thanks for our freedom today, let's worship. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Church family, we have come to begin again. The Lord has called us together and serve. Church family, we have come re renew our mission. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us rally. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us rally for the Lord. Join me in the opening prayer. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For opening him, uh, the the song was pretty amazing. And there's so much in it. Uh, so so some things that we could recognize as we're singing this is that God alone is the restorer. Um, he's the source of all true joy and fulfillment. Uh, he's the the sole savior, uh, and he's the only one that can really wash away all of our iniquity and sin. Uh, and uh, yeah, and just that that one line. It's it's a famous line, but it but it's always relevant. I, I feel like for me and for a lot of people, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So uh, I think we're going to teach uh, this this new uh, song here, the setting of uh, Psalm 51. So, so uh, yeah, we'll sing it through with me if you if you know this already. But it goes like this: Have mercy on me, O oh God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Let's do that again. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean 
seat, by the way. And if you didn't wear a red or a white shirt today with the symbol on it, um, you'll have to make an extra donation today. It'll <laughs> cost you $50, and there's a plate out on the table in the back there. Actually, I, for, I, I remembered at the last second, oh yeah, Rally Sunday. We're supposed to do some things on Rally Sunday, and one of them is to wear the shirt, the shirt. But it is our 56th anniversary. How many of you remember being 56? <laughs> <laughs> last year, all right, very good. If you can remember last year, that's even better. Rally Sunday, I, you know, I've asked probably 50 people in the church, what is Rally Sunday? I have 50 different answers. But the one thing that was consistent is we rally together as the family of God. We come back together again as the family of God. And then the other half of the answers were, and the choir's back. So that was very exciting to hear. And I know we have the choir singing with us today and leading us in worship. But to rally right now couldn't be more important uh, for the church. We still have this sort of not yet feeling uh, going around, I think, our communities. And a lot of local churches are sort of on this not quite yet. It's like... It's like if we just trust that God is going to take us forward in our ministry and into the lives of other people, then we're going to be set back once again by something else that happens. And that is certainly true as we remember 9-11. Like if we let our guard down, then something can happen. Well, something does happen every day, right? Yeah. And if you are so in tune with what's going on in the world, all over the world, since we hear about it instantly... Um, it's a little tough to keep hope alive. It's a little tough to say, it's okay, we can still step forward, we can still go out of our house. This morning as I was picking up donuts for Rally Sunday, so there are donuts after service out there in the courtyard, and we thank the Grins for uh, already, you know, um, setting up for us and, and getting ready for us to have some fellowship but as I was standing there in the donut shop down here at the bottom of the hill, I was standing next to a father who got out of his car. He had a, maybe a one-year-old and maybe a three-year-old, little girls, still in their Disney pajamas, standing in front of this case of donuts. You know, can you imagine the face? Like, like they had, this is better than Disneyland because it's all right in front of them. And then they had this arduous task of picking out one donut to split. And I'm thinking, Dad, come on. You dragged them out of bed. They're here standing here. You should at least get one apiece. But anyway, they had to agree. So I, I was listening to this debate about them trying to come together as a one and a three-year-old to decide which was the best sprinkled donut you could possibly eat at that moment in time. And as I was walking out, I just paused. Dad was close by, so I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna shake anybody's tree here. But I, as I was walking out, I just sort of kneeled down and I said, "Girls, how are you doing?" And they looked at me like, "We're so excited!" Like they didn't need the donut. It was like, and and I said, "Are you picking out a donut this morning?" And they didn't know whether they could talk to me or not. Not only am I a stranger, but I am a stranger with the fact that one of those girls was born during COVID. And the other one has not known life without a mask. And they, here they were, in pajamas in a donut shop on a Sunday morning with their dad, no masks on, just taken in the world. 
And so it took a third question to get a response, but I said, which one did you pick out? And they both put their fingers on the glass, you know, like that one. <laughs> Not the 10 behind it, but that one. So Ted was gonna come over and service this family. It's those two little girls that I'm after this morning, that we're after as a church. It's not because the next generation is more important than this generation. It's because this generation needs to remember that we rally for a purpose. We come together as the church to serve Jesus Christ in this community and in the rest of the world. We're going to be focusing on wheels for the world. We're going to be focusing on our stewardship. We're going to talk about our own spiritual gifts. All this is coming up in September and October. But for us to rally, for rally for what? To be together again? Yes, that's important. If you're watching from home, we want you to be here. We want you to come and celebrate with us. We want you to be safe, but we also want you to be back here with us in the building as well. But that's not enough. It's not enough just to gather and have donuts and whatever other goodies we have after church today. It's not enough just to be together and share stories of where we've been and how we've been traveling around the country or around the world. It's not enough for us just to gather and be in fellowship. Jesus warned us about this. He said, your faith, really, your faith is about how you serve. It's, it's how you treat the, the people who are lost and broken and imprisoned and hungry and naked and poor. It's about how our faith spurs us on to be in service to others. So we rally today for a purpose, and that purpose is all under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So sure or not, let's rally. Let us truly today commit ourselves to each other in love and prayer and to the work that is yet before us because the best days of this church are not behind us. The best days for St. Matthew are ahead of us. We have to believe that God is not done with us or this world or our country or anything else. We remember how tough it was to get here through COVID and through all that's happened, but we need to know that we're here for a reason to do something for our Lord and in his name. So let us rally together. Right, puppets? Are you there? Yeah. Oh, they are there. Oh, we've got a bird this time. All right. Hi there, my friend. How are you on this warm September day? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm just trying to figure out what the bulletin means by Rally Sunday. Do you know what it means? I mean, I know it happens every year, but I can never remember. And I tried to look it up, but Google let me down this time. Well, you know, there are actually several things that we celebrate on Rally Sunday, so let me break it down for you. I'm all ears. One thing we celebrate is the start of a new school year for the kids in the church. It's a time to celebrate new beginnings and for the rest of the church to rally around our kids and support them in their education. Oh, cool. That makes a lot of sense. My mom has been celebrating every day since I went back to school. <laughs> what else are we celebrating? Another thing we celebrate is the return of our church members from summer vacation. During the summer, people travel or visit family and aren't always able to make it to church on Sunday. So Rally Sunday is a chance for us to come back together in fellowship and community. Again, that makes sense. I like what I'm hearing so far. Is there anything else we celebrate on Rally Sunday? Yes, there's one more thing. It kind of builds off the other two. I'm intrigued, go on. As we come together in fellowship and community, and as we celebrate the start of the new school year, it is also time to rally together and reaffirm our commitments to the church. We look at what the needs of the church are for the upcoming year, and we listen to the Holy Spirit to show us how we can use the gifts and talents God has given us to help meet those needs. And it's not just about getting involved here at church. We also rally together to bring the love of God to our community. Wow, that's a lot to keep track of. I'm not sure I can do all of that. Well, my friend, that is where the rallying comes in. 
none of us can meet all the needs in our church and community on our own. But when we rally together and work together, it becomes a lot easier. The scripture this morning is from Psalm 51, verses 1 to 19, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. The word of God for the people of God. All right, so for today's anthem, the choir will be singing, Holy Be Thy Glorious Name. And uh, even though God is uh, infinite and and beyond description, complete description, uh, he's referred to uh, by various names through the Bible. So some of them are Yahweh, uh, the self-existent one, Adonai, uh, God is Lord over all, Yahweh Rohai, the Lord my shepherd, Yahweh Shama, the Lord who is present, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord our healer, Yahweh Tekenu, the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh Jira, the Lord will provide. Uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, uh, and so on. There's like, there's so many to, to list, but those are just a few. So maybe um, a nice study to, to just study his names and his attributes to really get a, a deeper, fuller understanding of who and what he is. <laughs> so here's Holy Be Thy Glorious Name.
Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So glad to have you here and to have Pat with us and, and have all of you back. I see a lot of faces here I haven't seen this summer. Um, either we've been gone or you've been gone, but or maybe you were sleeping. I don't know. It was one of those things. But we're so grateful to have you here. So where were you on September 11, 2001? And, and what were you doing that morning? Anybody have a quick story to share? Yes. Mary Beth, let's see if this is on. Yep, I think it is. I was at Westlake High School trying to deal with teenagers who were absolutely devastated. Mm. I uh, saw the first planes go in before I left home. By the time I got to school, turned on the TV in the room, the second plane hit. I had students in tears. I had students whose parents were in New York. We had students at universities in New York that we tried to contact. Um, I had students who were Muslim and they were absolutely not knowing which way to turn. Yes. It yeah. was one of the hardest days of my life, I think. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Sharp. I think one thing living in this area with proximity to the naval base. Yeah. Before the news really got out to us, because you know, you're busy, like they said that morning, getting kids ready for school, dropping off at school, the planes. That's what I remember is all of a sudden you heard all, every single plane from the Navy base, the fighters, everything taking off, and it's like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I was in the doctor's office in Palm Springs when I saw it. I couldn't believe what I could see. Yeah. It was the hardest day, I think, for a lot of people. It certainly was one of the worst days um, my, for me, for our family. And finding out later that because two of those planes were destined for Los Angeles, that um, we had a lot of people with a lot of connections. There was like two points away from somebody who was on that plane, uh, on, on either of those planes. And the most striking story was a, a man in our church uh, whose business partner was in New York and was late and he missed, uh, he, in Boston, and he missed the flight. So he was on, I think, flight 175, supposed to be, but the gate had closed and the plane left. So he has lived with that as well. Well, I've come this morning prepared to confess to you something that I haven't shared with uh, with well, pretty much anybody in the church. I didn't share this 21 years ago. Um, I'm still kind of ashamed by it, a little embarrassed, but I think it's necessary for us to talk about where we've been in order for us to talk about where we're going. Isn't it important sometimes to kind of go clean up where we've been before we are prepared to go forward? So here's my story rather quickly. My family gathered uh, in Florida and in other places we've lived over the years, my five brothers and my mom and dad, we, we spent a lot of time on boats and it was always my dream to have one. And so I made a first attempt, it was a nine foot little Sears fishing boat and uh, we put our five uh, in, in that boat and, and we sunk it. So that wasn't a good experience. <laughs> Um, but so we had saved a long time for this and uh, we finally decided we were going to get a boat to have our kids get on and we were looking for kind of a fishing boat that could pull a ski or that kind of thing. So my son Christopher and I, we went out and searched for a couple of months. We finally found one. Um, it was, nobody wanted it. It was too long for certain boat uses and it was too short for others. So it was down in Newport uh, at a, a marina down there. Um, at Hardin Marine, there's your plug, and um, and I, you know, we bought it. But our delivery date to go pick the boat up was September 11, and I got up that morning and I sort of glanced at the TV. Um, Stephanie was up early because she was about to go teach, and um, so I, it was like watching a, a bad movie that somehow got into the newscast. You know, it was like couldn't believe what was happening. But I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I thought I heard, and that was the first report, a small aircraft had accidentally hit the, uh, one of the towers of the World Trade Center. So 
got dressed, got in the car, and as I was driving down toward Los Angeles, and by the time I got to the 405, I was flipping around on news stations trying to figure out what was going on, but I really was not paying much attention to this. I was so focused on going to pick up something that I thought was going to complete my life as a 41-year-old with a family of three sons. Really wanted them to be committed to being together as they were teenagers as a family. We thought the boat was a, a, an important part of that. I was on the 405 and I realized I was one of the only ones on the 405. That should have been an indication that the world had ended. <laughs> I was making such good time that by the time I got to LAX, there were no planes on approach. You know, they're, they're all about a minute apart and you can see them on a clear day going to the east, that, all the way across to, you know, way out there, to, almost to the Inland Empire, you can see planes landing. The closer I got to this uh, marina where we were going to pick, where I was going to pick this up, and the more I'm thinking, you know, we're going to have a picnic dinner together and we're going to have a maiden voyage on Castaic Lake that evening. And by the time I got to Newport, I was on the phone with lots of people from the church. See, there was belief that one of the planes that was yet still missing turned out to be Flight 93, but uh, the plane that was missing, there was a lot of speculation that it would, they would strike next after the Twin Towers in the Pentagon, that they would actually, you know, strike a, a military base. And had a lot of people at Edwards Air Force Base that were on high alert and were in the air or preparing for um, some attack. The church was trying to organize and get rallied to come together, to have a prayer vigil. And I, as the pastor, was saying, well, I'm not sure we can you know, pull that together this quickly, and a lot of people are staying home. And I had all these reasons. And I would love to tell you that I was being a thoughtful, caring leader of the church in those moments. But the truth was, I wanted to pick up that boat. I wanted to have dinner with my family on the beach, and I wanted to go out and just spend a little time together. So I was more and more conflicted about all this. I remember the secretary calling and saying, Are, aren't we going to open the church up for prayer? And I said, of course, we've already done that. The trustees have already opened the church. People can come to pray, but we're not going to hold a formal service yet. So this panic started of what can we do? The Sunday after, by the way, 9-11, our church was packed. We had people standing on the grass outside the church that couldn't get in the building, listening to the service. Because the world had come to a crisis point. The United States had been attacked on our own soil. All of this was swirling and people didn't know what to do, what to think, where to hope, how to hope, who to hope in. So, you know, this was, this was a growing thing that was happening, but I was so focused on this. When I got to the marina, I walked into the shop to ask the foreman if I could pick up this boat and trailer and leave, and they were all gathered around the TV set, and they were watching the set here, and, the, and they were mesmerized by the news that was still yet to come. I made it from Palmdale to Newport Beach in one hour and 20 minutes. That's how open the freeways were. Never again. I would love to tell you at that moment when I saw them all around the TV that I would snap into it and realize how big this was. Now, I wanted to pick up that boat. I wanted to have a sandwich on the beach of Castaic Lake and be with my family. My goal was now to get home. Long story short, there's a lot of details in here, but I finally kind of pushed them and the the owner pushed them. People were wanting to get business done that day, and they did prep the boat and hooked it up to the, to the truck, and I left. And I was in such a hurry, and I didn't realize exactly what I was towing in terms of the length of it, and it's, it's a long, it's an aluminum boat, and so the wheels are in the back, so you, when, you, when you go around a corner, you, you, you take five feet off of your turn. So I'm going through a neighborhood to leave the Newport to get back on the main drag and make my way to the freeway. And I, I made the turn and I took off the front end of a Toyota, I mean of a Ford Taurus. I just, I ripped the whole front end of the car off. I folded the fender into the, the tire, into the wheel. Now any, any person, 
let alone a Christian, let alone a pastor, should have pulled over to the side of the road at that point and done something different than what I was doing. But I didn't. The next thing I thought is, I've got to find a crowbar. I've got to be able to pull this fender out so that I can get the trailer rolling again because I'm going home. I'm going to the lake at least with this new boat that we had spent 20 years saving for. It's the only thing on my brain. Yet still. So I walked into the body shop. It's like 5 o'clock and things are closing up and the sun's starting to get low in the sky. And I, I ran into this body shop and, and I said, does anybody have a crowbar? And here are about four men watching the TV. This is like eight hours after all this started to happen. And they're standing there. And I realize as I yell this into the room, and I'm not making this up, they all four turn around and they're all Middle Eastern men. And here's some white guy asking for a crowbar. <laughs> so the owner of the shop looked at me just completely in shock. And I'm sure what was going through his mind was, how are we going to live in this country with what just happened? I don't even think the news of who was taking responsibility for this had fully come out yet, but there was this sense. There was this sense in the room that they all of a sudden were, were no longer welcome to live in the United States, let alone do business let alone in a primarily white area called Newport Beach. I've thought about this a million times since this happened, and I, I thought they could have chased me out of the building, they could have, they could have just ignored me and, and left without any conflict at all. They could have done a lot of things. But this owner, this shop owner, he walked right up to me, and he said, how can I help you? So he brought the crowbar and two other people, and they went out there and they helped me pry this fender off of my tire. Okay. And I climbed in my truck, and it was only then that I started to think, am I, self, am I so self-centered, am I so stuck on my stuff, my needs, my dreams, that I could not see that the world was changing in front of me. Could I not see in the eyes of these four men the, the fear and the shock and the, the horror that maybe they would lose their livelihood and their family in this country, let alone who they were sending money home to, you know? The next night when we had this prayer vigil at the church and we had an altar call, we were asking people to come forward to pray for peace, to kneel at the rail. And I led that. I invited them to come and I was immediately at that rail and I didn't share this with them, but my, my entire prayer was a confession. What a sick and broken man I am and, and how awful it would be for me to even come before you, God, and ask for your forgiveness or any blessing whatsoever after I did what I did with such intention that for 12 hours I could completely hold off the rest of the world in this way. And on that 11th hour, which almost exactly is when they were prying this fender off, 11th hour after the attack started, I came to my 11th hour and realized what a terrible person I am. That was 9-11 for me. And for the world, it was a change. We would not be the same as a country. We would not be the same as an international community either. Our, our world of traveling between countries with out security and, you know, we had airports without security checks in them 21 and a half years ago. We, we walked on and off aircraft. We didn't have to show ID every time we turned around. Protocols in the Middle East and in 
Europe and other parts of the world had already ramped up years before we ever got to this point, but it changed us. And my confession that night was Psalm 51. This is what I prayed. Look, I know, God, that this was a psalm that was written by David after he had taken a woman off the roof and brought him into his bed and then crafted a plan to murder her husband. And here he's the chosen king of all time. He's the lineage of Jesus Christ himself, where he had to be born of the house of David. I still feel like I won up to David that day. I mean, I felt like I had done something worse. Because I could ignore for those hours the needs of others and the crisis that was happening at the same time somehow stand before that congregation of hundreds of people that showed up to hear the word of God and I was the one responsible to give them the gospel that next Sunday. The, the, so with a, I prayed for a broken and contrite heart. I think that is the place we have to start sometimes, with a broken and contrite heart. That's what David asked for. He literally in the psalm talks about this crushing that happens. That my bones, my body, my whole being has been crushed down, Lord, and now I'm praying that you would raise me up so that I can dance before the altar, before I can be the king that you want me to be. This was David's confession for this whole time. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew within me a right spirit so that I can go on to where we're going. I know where I've been. I pray that I've learned something since then as a person, as a pastor, as a leader, but I also know that we, the body of Christ, have a lot of confession that we have to make in our own lives in order for us to be able to go forward. We can't just move in and say, hey, let's rally together and do something great unless we are honest with ourselves and with God because nothing in this church will be good or worthy of God unless God is the one driving it. Unless it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are just not going to make great strides. And even then, the strides we make will feel different because the church is not coming to us anymore. The people are not just going to come to us. We have to be involved and engaged in people's lives where they are every day, wherever they are. I'd love to tell you that a week after that event, I went back to that body shop and apologized to those four men. I actually tried. But as I drove down there and I got to the front gate of this body shop, <clears throat> it said closed for business. I don't know if they ever reopened. I, I never went back to look. And the reason that strikes me so deeply is because we don't know how we react to life or to each other, how that can affect other people. But if we represent the very Lord who has this kind of grace for us, if we represent, if we, if we wear the name Christian, or we wear a shirt that says we belong to a faith community who is Christian. We have an impact on the world one way or another. One way or another. This is the basis of Psalm 51 for us. It's this psalm about how could something so awful, how could a person who has done such an egregious thing be the king and leader of the 12 tribes of Israel and then on to Somebody who would serve, who would be noted as the great king, who brought together all the nations and stopped war. See, the ironic thing is that Psalm 51 is a confession, but it leads into Psalm 52 and the rest of the Psalms, all right up to 75, that talk about the lamenting when the wars were lost, yet the celebration when the wars are won. And this internal war that we fight is not one that's out here. It's one that is within us. It's 
It's working toward having a clean and contrite and broken heart so that we can be servants of God, so we can actually do the work that's before us, so that we can serve and live in a country that continues to celebrate freedom. But at the same time, today we remember, uh, we remember, we remember 200 and, I'm sorry, 2,983 men, women, and children who died in 2001 in this event. Almost 3,000. I've been trying to make up for that day for years. A year later, Stephanie and I were going to the East Coast for a family reunion, and one of the priorities was to have our three sons, who were, two of them were teenagers, and one was kind of a tween at that point. Um, and we went to ground zero. And we stood there a year later. It struck me that one of our sons said, but Dad, it's just a big hole in the ground. And it still was. They were still cutting girders. They were still finding bodies. They were still trying to just cut away all of the rubble in order to plan for something for the future. Hundreds of men and women who were all over ground zero trying to make something of it. And across the street and half a block away was the United Methodist Church whose windows were completely blown out it's exactly what happened in the bombing in Oklahoma City. There was this decision, that congregation, are we going to rebuild or not? Are we, going to, are we going to have a future or not? I am glad to say that that church survived in more ways than one. And they're doing ministry right down there, not far from where the Twin Towers were. Starting with where we've been, and celebrating a lot about where we've been, but also confessing the things that have not gone well for us personally or for us as a congregation or as us in the community. We all make mistakes. Some of us are a whole lot slower to admit them than others, and I'm one of them. But I have to tell you, I've shared this story in pieces before, but I have never really said this out loud. I, I am ashamed of myself. On that day, so many people woke up to the fact that we needed God in such a deep way. And I thought I needed a boat. There's so much that we have to remember and bring back sometimes, painful. But I say this to you as your pastor. I say this to you as a person who sees for this church nothing but possibilities for the future. Nothing but possibilities. We are in the best possible place we could be. We are in the freest country there is. We are in a place where we can be forgiven and we can go on and we can do not just better, but we can do God's work in a way that we don't need to be ashamed of. And every time, we still have that boat, every time a child steps onto that boat, every time our grandchildren get onto that boat, I remember that day. And I try to serve as captain of the vessel from a very humble place. It's really not that big, but you know. <laughs> someone's gotta be captain, right, so. And I also know that we've met all of our daughters-in-law on that boat. And that boat separated those out from the herd that our children really didn't need to marry. And frankly, after a day on the boat, we found out what they were made of. And I keep thinking, well, maybe we should just sell it. We don't really get out on it that much. And yet our three grandsons got on it the other day when we took it out Labor Day, we got it out on the water and we went out here offshore and we sat in, the, in a feeding circle of dolphins and birds. And as we were leaving, the dolphins played in the front bow of the boat as we were going off and I was thinking, God, you are so good to privilege our family with this gift. I don't know, I don't know what we'll do with it eventually, but I know for this church, we have a future. We have an amazing future ahead of us. 
We're now part of a ministry called Caneo Connect, and the reason that's such an important thing is that we had over 30 people show up last Tuesday night in 100 degree weather to eat street tacos together and to learn a little bit about God. Did we have hundreds of kids? No, we had about six children, but hey, that's six more than we've had in recent times. We had 13 children fill that Children's Ministry Education Building for VBS this year. We, this church hasn't experienced VBS like this in a long, long time. We have such a future ahead of us. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to end the sermon right here, and I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I don't know what it is you need to bring before God. I've shared probably the biggest thing for me right now. That is to remember God is looking for a broken and contrite heart. God is not looking for offerings. God's not looking for more burnt rams or bulls or anything on the altar. God is not looking for bigger palaces or temples of worship. God is looking for us. Whatever it is you can confess, whatever it is that comes to your mind and heart, maybe you've already done all this. Maybe you are already in a good place. I'm glad for you. I'd like you to share with me how you can do that on a regular basis. But let us pray together our own personal confession and then let me offer a word of prayer in closing on maybe where God might be taking us. Let us pray together. And Kevin, if you feel moved to pray and play, then that's great. If not, then just we'll do it in silence. Jesus, every hour we need you. Every hour we need to be reminded of the sacrifice you made for us and how this life is not about what we can gain or own. There is nothing that can bring joy to our life more than being before you with an empty and contrite heart, asking you to fill it once again with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for answering these prayers we've prayed. Thank you that no matter what we've done, nothing can remove us from your love or from your purpose or from your church. We are the imperfect body of Christ waiting for your guidance, Lord, on what's next. How can we serve you? How can we be the body of Christ now in the challenging world that we have we remember all who have gone before us, Lord, and we honor their names. We honor the saints of this congregation. We honor the disciples. We honor those faithful that day who prayed and yet still lost their lives on 9-11. But as we remember, let that be our encouragement for what is about to happen. And take us into this life, not with distress, or fear, but take us into this ministry and our future here in Newberry Park as being all yours. We're all in to be all yours. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's people said,
As we continue our prayers, let us also remember the families of those affected from 9-11, as that wound still carries through the generations. We also lift up prayers for our fellow Methodist churches, Pioneer Memorial, and Big Pine Community United Methodist Churches as they're praying and asking how they too can serve and move into the future. We have some new praises within our own congregation. We're thankful that Pat's healing and able to drive. We're praying for Dan. We're praying for our church, Lord, as we look at our future and guide us in our growth and our enthusiasm for you. As we look to the screen, we have many people on our continued prayer list, people recovering from transplants, headaches, surgery, pain, and many other issues that are private. We also pray for those in cancer treatment as they continue to battle and gain strength, we pray, Lord. We also pray for those in hospice as they move on their journey closer home to you, God. May we each say a silent prayer in our own heart for those that we're thinking of this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. as Kevin blesses us with one of his many talents, um, let's think about our gifts we've been blessed with and how we can give back to God.
Father God, we lift up these offerings, just a portion of the multiple gifts that you have blessed us with in the hopes it will go forth to do your ministry, not only for this church, but for your world. Amen. Please remain standing for Shine, Jesus, Shine, and let them shine through you during this song. With the... With this hymn, I, uh, what came to mind was in Revelation 21 and 22, <clears throat> the last two chapters of the Bible, uh, when uh, the new heaven and the new earth were described, <clears throat> when the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea, and there, there's a new holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And one of the descriptions of it is that there will be no more uh, curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and uh, all will serve him. Uh, oh, and there shall be no night there. So that kind of was a unique thing that stood out to me, that there will be no more night, and there will be no need for candle, neither light or the sun. For the, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So basically, his glorious, infinite, eternal light will basically light everything. There will be no more need for, for lights or suns or anything, stars. So um, this is Shine, Jesus, Shine.
That's pitiful. Come on, people. Did you, did you feel the presence of God today? Yeah. Uh, amen. Amen. You can't clap for your own singing, but yet this is the most singing choir, church, and people I have ever been a part of. I mean that sincerely. I mean, I've preached in front of 500, and they have not sung as well as you guys sing. So, so awesome, awesome job. Which also means if you have a voice that you've never stepped into the choir, the choir would love to have you, yes? Right? Yes? Okay. And that includes men, too. It's not a Steve and women only choir, so think about that. Let me give you the benediction, and then I believe you're going to give us the life of the church today. So, um, merciful God, you are a God of mercy. You forgive us and restore us, not just so that our life could be more complete, Lord, but you do that so that we can be your servants. We can be your women and men and children of God. We can be the body of Christ. Take us into this day knowing that anything and everything that has happened in the past is to prepare us for the future. And we give you thanks for that. Thank you, God, for loving us unendingly. In Jesus' name. We got a lot going on, which is awesome. The book of James is finishing up this week at 10, I believe, Tuesday. Um, our family ministry is continuing through Caneo Connect. That's Tuesday evenings at Thousand Oaks. Free dinner, in case you don't want to cook, and also some awesome fellowship time. And that's for all ages, correct, Pastor Jim? Okay. Um, women's study starts next week, Tina, or this week? This week, Thursday at 11 here at church. Book of Hope, important, so we can move on and grow and survive. So, see, Tina, should they see you if they're interested? Come at 11. Okay, so if you like being on campus, get here so we can decide where we're meeting. Thank you for that. Men's study, Wednesdays at 11 and a breakfast coming up on October 1st. Choir, Wednesday nights in the sanctuary. You saw and heard some wonderful things. You saw the people. Talk to them or talk to Kevin. Well, mostly Wednesdays. Every now and then we have to change it for Kevin's schedule because he's a busy guy. <laughs> um, we do have our boutique coming up. We're pricing this week. We've got some incredible offerings from some incredibly talented people here. Uh, there are some flyers in the back. I've been starting to go around the community um, as well. We're praying, hoping the Acorn will publish us. Again, I submitted an email, but hopefully they will. Um, so that's in two weeks, September 24th and September 25th. We're excited about that. And we are going to have credit cards, cash, check, lots of possibilities. And yes, we're meeting on Wednesdays to get ready for this. <laughs> Women's retreats coming up October 1, see Linda Norberg. Or call the office if you're online and you need more information. They'll be happy to help you. Stephanie Powell is our guest speaker. So it should be a lot of fun and time for growth as well. And the important things. We do have our committees, and that's what keeps this church functioning. We have so many wonderful volunteers for that. So if you're involved with finance or church council, those meetings are this week as well. Thank you to the holders. Emma, you've got some great flowers to take home today. Um, and Robin and Rich are providing food for us, which is also wonderful. And there are opportunities to sign up for Coffee Fellowship, as well as picking up flowers as uh, we move into the fall. We've got a lot of birthdays today. 
just on September 12th. Look at that. Garrett, Emma, Rob, Linda, Dottie, and Andrew. So let's sing happy birthday to them. <laughs> <laughs>